This is an interview with Mrs. Laurel W. Oden, Laverne Civil Rights Institute's Oral History Project. I'm Dr. Horace Huntley. We're presently at the Birmingham Civil Rights Institute. Today is November 12th, 1997. Thank you, Mrs. Oden, for taking time out of your schedule to sit down and talk with me this morning. This one was first started by asking some questions about your, your parents. Now, were you born in Birmingham? I was born in Birmingham. Were your parents from Birmingham originally? Yes. Okay. They were not from, uh, many people that I've talked with, parents came up from like Greene County or some of the Black Belt counties. Uh, they might have. Uh, I know it was Midway Alabama. Midway Alabama. Where is that? That's down below, uh, going towards Florida, but not. It's in between. Now, her parents were from Tuskegee. Oh, oh. Her parents came. Right. My mother's parents. Is that right? It's just Carrie right. Dane. Right. Mm -hmm. She came from Tuskegee. Mm -hmm. Then they, she married Daniel. And moved to Midway. Oh, okay. And that's why my mother was born in Midway. Okay. And my father was born in um, Union Springs. Union Springs, so right. Okay. That's in this same, same area. Yeah. Right. Uh -huh. okay. And how many brothers and sisters uh, did you have? I, it's eight of us. So I had five sisters. And two okay. Where were you in that mix? Were you the youngest? I was the third. you the third oldest. Okay. Third oldest. Oh, okay. mm -hmm. right. And now you were born in Birmingham. I was born in Birmingham. And um, how much how much education did your parents have? Were they educated? No, they no, were not. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately. Mm -hmm. What kind of work did they do? Well, my dad worked in the mine. And then coal mine? Coal mine. Mm -hmm. Newcastle. Mm -hmm. My mom just did, you know, they would. Uh, she worked a lot. And out there. Clothes. They right. clothes for people. Okay. And uh, now I know that you left Birmingham at an early age. How old were you? About two years. <laughs> two years old. And where did you go? Where did you go? She took us to East St. Louis, Little Town. It's east of St. Louis, but it's in the state of Illinois. Mm -hmm. Across the river, the only thing separate St. Louis from East St. Louis is the Mississippi River. Mississippi River. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you, you then was raised on the Mississippi. Yeah, in between. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Um, and uh, you started your schooling in St. Louis. Right. What elementary school did you attend? John Robinson Elementary oh. School. What do you remember about those first days in school? Oh, they were beautiful days to me. It was enjoyable to me. Although we were poor, we had a... My mother always said we were very high man. Mm -hmm. And we did aim for it. And some of my sisters, I had two sisters there. I had one that's a retired school teacher from Birmingham. And another one that's working still in the system in St. Louis. And I had two sisters that retired that were Nurses. Three. I got three years for time. Is that right? Mm -hmm. So, how uh, you went to elementary school in St. Louis? And high school. And high school. Right. Okay. And then, but you graduated from Parker. That's high great. School. So, how old were you when you came back to Birmingham? Oh, I was 16. 16. And what were the circumstances of your return to Birmingham? Well, my brother came up there and got me, and he began to tell me I'd be interested in things that were back in Birmingham. And you know, I thought the thing that drew me, we could we wore clothes, but here you had to wear uniform, and I thought that was unique. So I wanted to come. It was going to be on trial basis, but I came and I liked it, and I stayed. What grade were you in? When I came here, I was in the 11th. 11th grade. That's what we 
call it. Now he didn't call it the, a junior. Right. Mm -hmm. That's right. Well, how did you compare your high school in St. Louis with Parker High School? No comparison. And I, I don't say that ugly, but mm -hmm. I just say it because when I came here, I don't remember anything such as when I came here, I had learned thanatopsis. Mm -hmm. And we were supposed to learn that in the 12th grade here. Right. And when they had it, I already knew it. Okay. Right. So you so were ahead of the I was ahead. Class. I was very much ahead because some of the students that went to Miles College, I was able to help them with their work and hadn't had no college education. But I took French three, I was going into the third year of French. And that was a speaking year, right. and we were learning. But it was from September to February that I stayed, and we would speak English in this class. It was very interesting, and all the grades I could take the grades. And I remember in a history class where this uh, man, Mr. Gladden, was my teacher, and he would tell us about the uh, things that we had to come through. To get where we was. And was I, this in St. Louis? This was in St. Louis. Also, the daughter of granddaughter of Nat Turner was one of my teachers in St. Louis. So, uh huh. And they were old then. Right, right. <laughs> well, did she teach you about Nat Turner? Yeah, but I can't remember. You know, that's been something like about 50 some years ago. <laughs> and it's hard to remember everything. Right. Sure. Mm -hmm. But it was very interesting. And when I came here, I did like it. I was in the <laughs> class. Mr. Norman, J.D. Norman, was my first teacher that I could remember. And Other than the, the curriculum that you were seemingly ahead of, what were the differences in Parker and in your schooling in St. Louis? In terms of, was, were you, did you attend an, an integrated school? We really no, not in a great school, but I lived next door to white people when I came here. We really, well, yeah, and, and two places we moved in, we lived next to white people. It was slightly different, but not a great deal of difference. I found out one thing, and that's till today, that haven't changed the employment situation. Is still the same. Now, I don't know of any prejudices here. I mean, there that you could just pull out because my sister is in a school in St. Louis. She's not, she's not, she's out of the classroom teaching in which she did. She started in 57, she's only 60. And she's been teaching since she was in the fifth or seventh. Mm -hmm. time she finished high school, she went right into teaching. Mm -hmm. She didn't have no space. And she teach and she went back and received a doctorate degree. She had a doctorate mm -hmm. in St. Louis. Mm -hmm. So the education is good. Now there, my sister received a, a degree, I mean she a scholarship, a four year scholarship to Illinois State. University. That's where she finished from. Mm -hmm. In St. Louis. Now you say that you live next door to white people. Were you referring to St. Louis or to Birmingham? Oh, I was referring to St. Louis. <laughs> when I came here, I was so unlearned to the laws here. Okay, when my brother brought me here, we came on the train. We got off the train and we got on the bus. And me never seeing it in my life, I sat in the front section. And my brother was looking for me everywhere on the bus. So finally he came back. He said, come back. Come back here. Well, I didn't, you know, I can make an issue. I'm not that type that I would make an issue. So I just went back and sat down. And that was never explained to me. No more than later he told me when you get on the bus, you go to the back. Well, I don't know. My sister used to tell me that my mother and I was the soft hearted one. We let people run over, that's what they right. called it, because we wouldn't 
flesh of the heart, and we just accept the thing as they were. But I didn't like it, but I accepted it because it was the law of the land, and I liked living here. So I just stayed here and accepted the term. But I mean, it was a fast living, and we were fast in St. Louis, and I couldn't go. <laughs> So I like Birmingham in that manner. That's why I stayed. What neighborhood did you live in when you came here? What neighborhood? When I came here in the western section, I've been there ever since. I left, and it was an integrated section, but not side by side. Which community? In Rising, out by Rising. Rising. Anywhere. Uh, Ringwood Field, it? close that way back. I lived in the 1300 block. Ringwood's 12. Right. And we lived in the 1300. I lived with my sister. Man. My brother brought me here and he wanted me to stay with him, but I enjoyed where my sister lived better than I did with my brother. He lived on Pusa Street in East in uh, East Birmingham and she lived in the Western section. So I like living with her, so I lived with her. And I finished school there. What do you remember about Parker? As a junior and a senior, were you active? Were you involved mm -hmm. in extracurricular activities? I was in the choir. Mm -hmm. And uh, were there any teachers that you remember that made an impression on you? He was Mr. Norman. Mr. Norman. Okay. Yeah, he wanted, he, he, he really, I guess I'm like my little granddaughter. She was on the, what is that thing? Mm -hmm. Spectacle. And she was telling the people that what she wanted. She said things that were too easy for her. It was harder for her to get back than it was for something that was real hard. And she would like for them to um, make things a little harder where she could grasp for, you know, grasp more. Appreciate it more. Appreciate it more. Yes. Right. And so that's the way. <laughs> and that's that's what Mr. Norman did. He he liked you. He did his work. Right. Loved it. Yeah. Now at that time in the mid forties, Parker was a pretty large school. Very. Was, it, was the school that you attended in East St. Louis was the largest Parker? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Just a normal class, I believe. If I had graduated there, I might have been in a class. Of about uh, 47 to 50 people. I could almost name them Target Smith, Moe Wade, just um, <laughs> Ross right. Miller. Right. Yeah, you could just about name all of them by class, and it wouldn't be no more than about 40 something. It was a small school. Now, it was situated in the section almost, I guess, about eight or nine blocks from the town, okay. from the little town. It's a oh, small. Right. East St. Louis is small. Yeah. St. Louis is long. Yeah. Now you said it was uh, it was predominantly black, or was it uh, all black? Your school in East St. Louis. All black. It was all black. It was all black. Mm -hmm. I don't remember going to an uh, integrated school. Mm -hmm. okay, so that was no difference than when you came to Birmingham. Not not part of it. Be all black as well. I mean, that the only thing I can remember was. The curriculums that they gave us were very good. We, when the war, if we, we were there about the time of the war, and I had an opportunity to take uh, classes, advanced classes, such as shorthand and typing. Miss Gardner and I, which was uh, ahead of me, we taken uh, now either shorthand or it might have been it was shorthand. I believe we took. Yeah. Um, the Miss Gardner that you referred to is it's, it's Edna Gardner. Yes. She was an Edna Miller lady. Okay. Edna Miller Gardner. I see. Uh, mm -hmm. Now, how was she related to uh, uh, Dr. Gass? She was related to him by that. Her mother and father were, they came from Massachusetts to East St. Louis, and he was the principal, and her mother was a teacher, and he kept the principal until he gave it up at 
this school, Lincoln High School in the Illinois. He sang for us. He was a principal there. In fact, he was the one that granted my, my sister a scholarship. I could have gotten it, but right then I told him I want to marry. <laughs> So after high school, you married. That's what I did. <laughs> well, that's what I thought that was what I wanted to be. Mm -hmm. And I did. I enjoyed it. Everything. I have five children. Right. And they, they are in the field. As I said, when the civil rights, right after the civil rights, they were opening up things. And they had this program where uh, if you were in the lower income, and at that time my husband and I had was in the process of divorcing because of the movie. He said I was following. Okay, well we're gonna get to that just a little bit later. Let's oh, I see I, what I'd like to know now. You were you finished high school in the mid forties. Um, and you got married, you started having children. Um in fifty four the, it was when the Brown versus Board of Education decision. Right. Um, then in 55, he had the Montgomery uh, bus boycott. Um, the movement here will begin in 1956. Were you involved in the initial uh, development of the That's Alabama right. Christian movement? The first. The you first meeting. You had the first think. meeting. Tell me about the first meeting. I can't remember. They didn't think no more than I was there. Mm -hmm. And I remember, but I know what they were about to do. And I was so excited about it that I began to go back and tell my minister. And he told me, he said, well, we're going to pray about it. We're not going. And they didn't participate. I was the only one in my community that participated, my daughter and I. My daughter was one of the first ones that tried to integrate uh, one of the churches, sent out the integrated church, but they turned them down. So what church was that? That was a church that fortunately they later, both churches that turned, she and Mrs. Uh, I forget the lady's name, but they were turned down at, at this, it was uh, Hunter Street. Hunter Street and also before they went to Hunter Street, this little church on Greymouth that, uh, what is it, that Reverend Petty Group? Right. He bought that church Sorry. and also the church, Hunter Street Church, which turned them out. Okay. They were able to buy both of these churches that they had been turned down yeah. in the movie. Uh, so that was that was history. <laughs> were you a registered voter? I was a registered voter. Huh. Do you remember when you became a registered voter? Yeah. What did you have to do to become a registered voter? Oh, they asked us so many crazy questions. But fortunately, I was able to ask. Do you remember any of the questions when they asked you? I can't even remember. But you do so remember that they were? They were crazy questions. Right. Nothing to do with, okay. you know. Right. Did you have to prepare anyone else to take the test after you had gone in to take it? Oh, I told a lot of people, you know, what they were going to ask and everything. Possibly what they would ask. Because I heard that they did ask some people, you know, different questions. Right. So I don't know, but I told them what they had asked me and encouraged many people to vote right. that weren't voting. And what do you remember about those first days of the movement? Oh, they were some horrible moments. Oh, I remember it was like terror. I remember the night. I remember the night. Now, I wasn't at the... Uh, Place, but I was at every movement that was there. Everyone they had. Sometimes they'd have call me and have a, a, a meeting. I would be there. That was just like it was just love for me. I couldn't, I couldn't stay away from it. And then I always encouraged people to go. But at that time, it was very hard. People were working. They were afraid of their job, of being fired. And some of them would like to, they would like to go. And then most of the people that I remember, I remember Mr. Herbert Palmer, he lived in the community where I lived. And I, at that time, I couldn't drive a car. So he was the one that would always, we'd have to get there. And he would take us and other people would take us when we didn't have a ride. And it would be three of us that would go. And also one of the persons that 
were that were able to go to the University of Alabama. They were some people that were in that community. Her mother also went to the moon. And we had to watch her house. And when we found out who it was, my nephew, who had been a part in the movement, he was in the movement, he was arrested. And I had another one where the water hose was turned on. I mean, it was turned on in full force. Who was this, a neighbor? Who was the water hose turned on? Oh, that, that was my nephew. Your nephew? My nephew. And my nephew, well, the other nephew was arrested. Okay. He had a part in it also. Right. The name was, they were James Mullen and um, William Mullen. Hmm. William Mullen was arrested. Okay. James Mullen had the hose pipe turned on him. And one day, it was so horrible to a woman was standing there, and the police just took her by the hand and just slung her up on a car, had dogs and everything. I remember a dog biting a man just in his pants. Police right there didn't do anything. And also, a night that we had left the church and we were going to Liberty Supermarket to have a peaceful march from the church to Liberty Supermarket. And just as I approached, now we had detectives that followed us from the meeting there. And just as I stepped across that line, I heard a shot. And we looked back, and Mr. Armstrong, I believe was the man's name, he was an old man. They had shot him. Also, this fellow that was shot at Chief City. Who shot the man that delivered Mr. Armstrong? Oh, was, we, we no never, sir. no, no, sir. But the officer was right there with them, mm -hmm. walking along. They saw what was They happened. saw what was happening. Oh, they looked at him. The police took this woman and just slung her. Just took her and just slung her like you would a dog. That's the way they did her. And they didn't just do it one time. If she'd get up, they would do it again. For no reason whatsoever. Inhuman. And then they had nights where they would come in the building, the fire department would come in the building and, and because it would be full. We didn't have room for the feet. During the, the movement meeting. This is during the meeting. And I remember a night Reverend Show where said, let's not get frightened over that. So we used to this and we got to get used to it because they're not gonna stop it until something is done. Yes. And they 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 come in there with the hole like, you know, like we had that. And I don't know, I don't know if anybody left. I didn't. I stayed there until the very end because I've always felt like this. If you're in the hands of the Lord. He should always take care. You're not going to let nothing come upon you. But I did see a lot of things that were. I was also present the Easter Sunday that Martin Luther King was in jail over there and we went over on that, I believe, Sixth Avenue. Some was in the park, some was on the park where he worked. But I remember Bull Connor telling me, fine, said, put the holes to him. But you know, we fell on our knees. Everybody said, let's fall on our knees. We fell on our knees and we began to pray. And I heard the Bible tell us, I can't move. I can't move. So I knew then that God had answered prayer. They could not move, though. They couldn't. He couldn't turn the hole. He kept telling them. He said, turn the hole. He was giving them the command. But they said, I can't do it. I can't do it. So they were successful that day. But they really tried, they tried every means to stop us from it and to scare tactics, scare people from the movement. And even, I remember I had my little granddaughter and one lady that I had encouraged to come, she had come. She told me, she said, Lauren, you don't have any sense. Give me this baby. She took the baby home. Got fighting because so much was happening because of it. And I stood there and I Stood the test, and then things began to brighten up. I remember when they bombed uh, uh, Shore's home and uh, Reverend Shoresworth's house. I remember when his children were beat unmerciful for trying to integrate the school. You know, who was, many, that was 
Shuttlesworth. Realm of Prayer. Shuttlesworth. Realm of Prayer. He he got some licking. They bummed his home and everything and beat him and his wife and his children trying to go up here to kill us. Right. I remember that incident. It was just so many things. They weren't little either, right. but they were horrible. You know, I used to go to bed and I just cried, God, how long? How long? You know, well, this, you know, you, you see, you got all skin and I, and I know. You see and hear, pray, and this can't continue. You know, the way they were doing, they were just doing things that were just really unrealistic. But I recognize one thing, as I recognize now, that it takes love. God is love. If they don't have the love of God, you cannot legislate or force nothing on nobody. But it's got to be in love. But I've, I've seen things that have happened. Right now, my granddaughter in, in uh, Tuscaloosa, she finished still in high. was an honor student from the first grade. Not, you know, they don't have honor roll. But I mean, she was an honor student. Even from Lincoln, she went to Lincoln High School. From Lincoln High School to Park High School. And she was in that accelerated class from the time she went into college. It's still in college. You know, in the accelerated class and finished, cool law. She she got laxed along the way, but she did good. She had many, she had many things. She won contests that they had. I think Grandma Woods uh, won first place, but you know, but she won second. She was the only girl that won in there. And she went on and she's real smart. And she got a job. And she began to face discrimination. She said, Grandma, I can't believe this. She said, I'm here with a college degree, have to correct all of their mistakes. Said three of them here that can't spell. I mean, can't spell nothing. And their incomes are twice back. And is that today? That is today, about two years ago. That was her first job when she finished college. She took it, I think it was paying 15000 a year. But they were making 20 something Then she uh, put in for another job where when she went to it, this same girl, but she had corrected all of her grades. She was giving key punching things in for the doctor. She worked, they were just working it everywhere. She said two people quit. She took those people's job and said a man told her that he wanted to talk to her about her attitude. So when she got through telling him, and she had all her papers out to show him what she had did. And when he got through, she said, and you all told me that in three months I would get ready. I never got the raise. Then you said later I would keep on getting raised. She said, I haven't got the first raise. I was doing three people's job. She said, maybe I might have been here tomorrow because I wasn't getting paid for nothing but one person. And you know what he did? He did give us the money and told her that she was, you know, she was due the money. Okay, here about a week ago, she was working at uh, Tuscaloosa. I'm just telling you some of the things that are still existing. She called me and she told me, she said, Grandma, I just got back. And it was so... Uh, she was so shocked over it until she she's six months pregnant. And she said she when she knew anything, she was packing. And she had fallen out. She said, one of them came and put a paper sack on me. She said, please call the family. And then she said she couldn't hardly breathe. And they put a sack over her face. And her husband was outside. And they wouldn't let him in. And said, the man told him, you better not let him in this place. And where's she working? She was working with Miss Wayne. Now last year she made twenty five thousand dollars doing extra work. What she had to do is sell t-shirts on the side of her job. She has to do her job. Then this is extra money. She said for the last two years she had never, never went under her goal. In fact, they was gonna give them a bonus this year. 
so to keep from giving her the bones. She had already made the bones. He died. And in the I mean, these are things today. happening today. All white. All white, though. Um, what you call it? What's over here? Supervisors. Supervisor. Yeah. All white supervisors. Right. And none of them have made, maybe she said about four that have made it. Mm-hmm. And she's the only one that have made it, you know, mm-hmm. and in that. Now she's the only one that made it. So they have made it. All of these <laughs> supervisors over her right. have made it, but she was one. Is having having to go and find a job. Yeah. So that just says it, it continues. It continues. Let me ask you about the movement days. You attended all of the mass meetings. Yeah. All of the mass. Meetings. How then would you for somebody who never went to a mass meeting? How would you describe a mass meeting to a young person today? What would you say about it? It was awesome because we. We really had church, and then we had preaching, and then we had business meeting, which was uh, telling us, you know, they had nonviolent business, and they would tell us about, you know, how to carry ourselves and how not to fight back. That's what they would, you know, we were told in these meetings and everything, regardless of what happened. It's not what happened to you, but count, but it's how you take. So. You have to give in, and you can't fight back because if you fight, God's not going to fight for you. So we were told things that would help us out and not us to get, and it was hard not to get angry. But it, it, you know, when you see about it, and I've heard different ones tell how they would maneuver, you know, they would maneuver, and, and what would make them so angry with them. They outnumbered out the people that was supposed to, they didn't do what they wanted them to do. So they would get angry with them and want to fight them and do things. So it was really, it, the meetings were very exciting. You, you would enjoy going to it. Everybody that I ever took, they enjoyed it. However, a lot of them didn't continue on because, as I said, they were fearful of their jobs. Most people that I know, including my husband, my children wanted to march at park so bad. He told them, he said, if you get in there, I'm going to let you stay in there. He, you know, he would scare them. So he couldn't scare my little baby, my little baby girl. She went on and... Did he scare the rest of them? Well, he scared the boys. So they, they, didn't, they, didn't they didn't They couldn't participate in nothing. Mm-hmm. Only one thing I remember that I forgot what that was, but they, that was after the fact. <laughs> it was after were the Were they fact. at Parker? They were at Parker. But they couldn't. They were not known not to. You tell them, you won't have no food. I'm not going to lose my job. He mm-hmm. would tell them daily, so naturally. And they've always been kids that they... Until today, I had children that, um, you know, they were well trained. I'm not saying it, but they are. Right. I know that you participated in the, the march over on the south side when Dr. King was in, in jail. Yeah. Uh, were there other demonstrations that you participated in? Other well, activities? the one that I, where I was at Liberty Supermarket. Okay. okay. And then after the fact, we integrated with the lunch council peacefully. After they had agreed, and we didn't have no trouble, no trouble, because it was already agreed upon, and it wouldn't be no trouble. But we did, Reverend Lewis and I, and I believe it was two more, but I don't know who they were. Is that Abraham Lewis or Calvin Lewis? Calvin. It was Calvin. And I worked along with him in several aspects. Like I say, it's so, it's funny, but it's, it's been some years ago, and some things you can't remember everything. Sure. Right. But I do remember we did peacefully go there, and everything was all right. Love mm-hmm. and for sex. Yes. Right. Now, you said that your, your husband didn't participate. Oh, no. And did that create any problems in your family? 
Hey, because of your your uh, participation. Yeah. He got on the witness stand and told the law he had agreed to give me. I had five children. He had agreed to give me thirty five dollars a week. When they when he got up there and told those people I was following Martin Luther King, and uh, the lawyer said, "Oh, that's not the matter, ain't he?" But he took it down to twenty dollars. And he ended up with a $30,000 house that they gave him. They didn't give it to him in court, but I never got a penny out of it from that day. This was the boss uh, proceedings. Huh? Mm -hmm. That I would live in the house until the largest, oldest child got to reach this majority age. Mm -hmm. And then it was just left blank. Mm -hmm. Then they come back and they told me that uh, he would go up on payments. And then we were divided at the end. He never did that. My lord left, he down there you know, in some county, a judge, left the case open. And my husband bought the other attorney out. And I didn't get one dime. His new wife got it. But that's all right. I'm in a house, my son, you know, and everything. I got one son. My children don't bother me. They're not giving me any trouble. You think your divorce though was based upon your activities in the Oh, it was definitely. But look, that's no comparison to me. What I see God have done through the moon. I gladly give it up mm. because of the progress that was made through the movement. Right. It was made through the movement. No other way. And those hard people, that little kind of was back. Ooh, I've never seen a man on earth like him. Did you ever meet Bill Connor? Never, never wanted to see him. <laughs> <laughs> did, never you, wanted did you ever meet Martin Luther King? Yes, yes. Yes, I met him. Met him first. Mm -hmm. And talked to him, but it wasn't, I don't think I saw him over five times in my life because, you know, people like that, they don't get uh, close to you because they have to get out of the way. And it's good for them. Mm -hmm. Because you don't know who. Sometimes they send people in to try to hurt him. Like up in New York when he was hurt. It's that. Right. And we don't know who did that, do we? Yes, ma'am. It was a black woman. Oh, shit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. See, so do you see what I mean? Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. So this is what you have to be careful of. You don't know who to trust. Right. right. So therefore, you have to be real careful. So I do Mm -hmm. So what, what have you been doing since the movement? Well, now, in 1972, I uh, joined the Integrated Church. And the church was that? That's Faith Temple on 3230, Jefferson Avenue. Mm -hmm. And when I went there, I found more love than I ever found in my life. This is what drew me. It was love. And I found the love that I've never seen them. And I used to tell my son, I said, son, I said, you want to see some love? He said, mom, I work with them kind of folk every day. <laughs> he said, don't tell me about that. I work with them kind of folk every day. But he didn't. He didn't understand. And they don't. The only time they ever been there, my son, is when I was ordained. I was ordained in that church as a full gospel minister. And uh, that was in 1917. Three when I went there. Mm -hmm. And I've been there ever since. And I, I was. This is an interracial church. It's an interracial church. Now, when I went there, it was 95% white. Now it is 99 and 100% black. Is that right? We have about 30 out of the list, about 700. The 30 whites out of. Mm -hmm. And and some of those that are relatives, she has a she has a daughter. Who is she? The pastor of the mm -hmm. Have a daughter, a son, daughter-in-law, son-in-law, and the son-in-law's family. Some of the son-in-law's family, and some of her friends go there. And then we have a couple that live across the street from the church that takes care of the church. Mm -hmm. Them members there. 
and another family, and one family come from Jasper, then white, and there's two sets of them, the mother and father, and then the son and his wife, they come there. Why did, uh, why has the church changed? So you said this is an interracial church, now why has it changed so much over time? From predominantly white to the predominantly black. Well, you know what that what has it always been in Birmingham is interracial. Now they were they were lovable people, but when you know sometimes we can make statements. I did many times, unfortunately, not intentional. But sometimes I make statements maybe that may not be. So statements have been made to the fact that. They would see more blacks in heaven than they would white. Mm-hmm. And a white woman saying she was called, um, you know, a lover. The man before she came was castrated because he allowed blacks to come in. Many she people. Was castrated? You heard what I said. About him? Oh, he was crying. While he was a minister there? While he was a minister of that church. And you were you were a member of the church? No, I wasn't a member then. I wasn't a member since she's been there. She's got in threat. She's gonna buy this Coca-Cola <coughs> company that lot out there and build a church out there on the highway. That's the smell of highway. And I was over her house when they called and told her that they were coming to get her. She said, I'll be right here. I live here, and this is where I live. And you come on, and I'm ready for them. not to fight me. Right. This was the clan. This was the clan that was talking to her. And so she talked about it, and she said, well, she said, I'm not going to fight them. I don't need that property. I got property here. We've already settled here. Blacks is going here. And anywhere my blacks can go, I don't. This is what she said. So that made it, you know, when a lot of the whites, they just don't like that. See, when they when she came in, they thought she was going to be a kind of thick rude. And they tried it for a while and give her everything she wanted. But she wanted to be sold. She said, God sent her back and not man. And she don't have to answer to me. And God, she said, I don't want to God made all nations. We don't know why God made us uh, as he made it. The only thing I can see, he wanted a flower garden. So he chose that. And if we can't look past color, she said, I look at my color. She said, I'm the same color that I was when I come here. Mm-hmm. And you're the same color. You can have nothing to do with it. You could, our parents are the cause of us being the color we are. Mm-hmm. So we have to accept the fact. And it's not what the color of a man's skin. This was on the inside of mm-hmm. She said, I've had some blacks that have been sweeter to me than my own people. And likewise, I've had some more that have been that way. But it, it wasn't the color of their skin that made them treat me that way. But it was the love of God mm-hmm. that dwelt on the inside of them that made them treat me that way. And that's the, way, that's the only way I take it. Mm-hmm. In any other way, it's just man. What do you know about, you mentioned that the minister that preceded her uh, was castrated because, why was he castrated? Because of blacks going to the church. Right. See, he was the first one to allow blacks to come to the church. He was Frank Johnson. Mm-hmm. And what happened to him? Did he leave the church after she came in or was he? No, he, his wife and him was co pastor and I think his wife died, and it, it was just chaos. Chaos. He couldn't. He couldn't within, hold it down. Within he the sick. church. Yeah. He couldn't hold it down. Now the people weren't that were well, that. They weren't. When I first come there, they 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 welcomed me with open arms. They treated me like a a queen. It's some of my people not treat me like I've had her to treat me. When I came back, I was destitute because I was getting, you know, well, I think all my children had finished at that time. They did. They, all of them was going to 
college. They had two years in college. I did without him. And but I never told this is what I didn't tell you was. Was when my daughter finished West End High School, I had a daughter, two daughters that finished. The boys finished part of high school. <laughs> and the girls went to West End High School. Did they integrate West End High School? Somewhat, yeah. One of the girls that was with my daughter, one boy spit in her face. But she, she took her books. <laughs> you know, some people just can't take things. Right. She was one of them. She wowed him. He gave him a wham. Mm -hmm. And told him if he if she catch my game, she what she would do. <laughs> and she was a girl. Mm -hmm. That was them, bro. Mm -hmm. But and that was yeah, good job. Now she she was over something. It, it, it was Cooper Green. Mm -hmm. What's her life like? Death right. It used to be Deborah Taylor, but she's something else. Mm -hmm. Was she Deborah Taylor? Was she that was No, she was Deborah Scott. Oh. Deborah Scott. Mm -hmm. And then she married mm -hmm. me. They divorced and then she. Mm -hmm. um, you've had a, a quite a life in terms of the period that you, you came through and you, you sacrificed an awful lot. Of the movement, um, but you seem to be, you seem to have accepted it very well, and, uh, and you seem to be like the postures at this point. Well, I, I think so. I think so. Don't want this to go on camera, but I was just blessed with the 1979 Ford LTD. I wasn't able to buy it, and I went and I explained it to somebody. I said, I'm not able to make payments. Mm -hmm. So they said, well, the Lord had already spoken. Mm -hmm. So I picked it out. I picked it out. Mm -hmm. And I got it. Told one down. Mm -hmm. What kind of? It's a kind of car? 79. Told me it was a deal. You've been very helpful. I appreciate your time. Is there anything else that you would like to include before we conclude? You're taking me from East St. Louis all the way to Jefferson, Jefferson Avenue. Right. Uh, is there anything else that, that, that did not cover that you'd like to say? Any statements that you would just like to leave, leave us with today? Well, love, let love continue. Do we let love continue? All of these things could be solved. But we know that love is missing because if it wasn't missing, see, God is love, and we can only work through love. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. All right. Uh, well.